But as far as the country goes, we're up and we're positive on the year price-wise. So at when mortgage rates started coming up, the Fed started raising rates, you came up with the video, gonna crash worse than 2008, all that stuff. What do you think now after it's been a year? I'm making more offers today than ever in my life. Why? So you, your argument is a fine argument. My argument is, Coming to you from sunny South Florida with one of the most incredible human beings on the planet, Mr. Patrick Betts. David, what's up, man? Not much. It's good to uh, have you here. Yeah, thanks for You like the beach in Alabama? Hey, it's yeah. It's beautiful, yeah, right? Tell you about this. I, I love it. Realize it. <laughs> I was going to ask you what the uh, what your first thought, the first image or word that comes into mind when you hear the word Alabama. I went to Alabama to go to Panama City when I was at Fort Campbell, That's Kentucky. Smart. Yes, and we were going to Club La Vila and Spinnakers, and we stopped by a Waffle House, and the waitress was looking at me because I was in the Army, and she says, where are you from? I said, I'm from Iran. And she says, you're from Iran? I said, I'm from Iran. <laughs> so what are you doing here in the States? I said, I'm a spy. I'm here to spy on your country and take all the stuff back home. But that's my memory. A Waffle House in Alabama in 1997, 98, Go to party in Panama City. Yeah. Was it was it by the beach? No. Or was it out it was the middle of nowhere? Out, out middle of nowhere. Literally nowhere. Yeah. Did you know that we had beaches? I did, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the Florida beaches extend in Alabama a good 40 miles. So that's where I grew up. I sell go front condos mostly. So we have a population of like 20,000, but we have about 8 million visitors every year. So it's a high tourist. You so know, it's a tourist. Uh, really good market. Really? Yeah, yeah. What's comparable to the city you're in? So if you were to say it's kind of like Panama City, it's kind of like... They all have their own different personalities. Okay. They're all have a Is different... it a nightlife or is it like no, a tourist? No, it's family. Okay, it's family. family. It's Got kind it. of in between. It's not like retirement, but it's Makes not sense. totally young. They have a couple clubs and stuff, but it's not Nothing crazy. crazy. It's club for baby. I, I was telling my buddy when I got here yesterday, I couldn't imagine growing up here. Yeah. <laughs> well, they have a lot of good churches here, except they call them clubs here. <laughs> So, uh, we also have Blue Angels right there. They fly right out of Pensacola, Florida. Right. Yeah, the Blue Angels. We had them yesterday. We, I mean, we had them yesterday. We were watching them yesterday. Bunch. It was great. Kids loved it. One of my sons, I'm like, would you want to be a pilot? Dad, I have no desire to want to be a pilot. You know that. He's just sitting the board out of his mind. Another kid is excited. It's, it's funny how at an early age, you can see if there's any interest for something or not at all. Mm-hmm. I've seen you on the boat. I saw you with your kids. You feel like you're just living the dream? Uh, this was all part of the plan. You know, uh, uh, when, when I was 23 years old and I went through a bad breakup and I asked myself, if your daughter came home with the 23-year-old version of you today, would you be okay with her marrying him? And I said, no, I wouldn't be okay with that. So well, then we got to get to work because we got to increase our options. Because the 23 year old me didn't have a lot of options that were somebody I can pick and choose. It was kind of like nightlife girls, you know, that kind of audience I was a part of. Uh, but that was a different audience. And then one day I'm like, you know what? What do I want to do when I uh, have a family? You I have up? kids. Yeah, when I, I'm 30, 35, 40, you know, just Americans, they like to do this uh, sleepovers. I'm not a fan of that. So I said, if we're going to do the sleepover stuff, they're going to only sleep over at the house. So we got to have a good argument for everybody to come to the house. So, okay, let's give them the opportunity and the lifestyle. And then I am uh, uh, the one as a kid, I always wanted a big family. I have, I have, I'm from a small family. I have one first cousin. I have three uncles and one aunt, biological, but they collectively had one kid. Four of them combined, only had one kid. And so I always wanted a big family, and I would, used to think about, you know, later on when the kids get married and... You're doing Christmas and they have to debate between coming to our side of the family or the in-law side of the family. I want the grandkids to choose to want to be with this grandpa. So I got to give them a good argument, good lifestyle for us to come together. This was all a dream. And now, you know, uh, is a reality, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I was telling people, I'm going down here to interview Patrick, interview Patrick. And I was so surprised about 50 percent of the people that follow me that told that to didn't know who you were. Right. That makes sense, though, no? Kind of, yeah. kind of, you know, but um, just for the people watching, nothing crazy, no, no long, elaborate deal, but just introduce yourself to, to the people watching, just my following, because yeah. I didn't realize it. I figured everybody knew who you were. It's I'm crazy. You think forever. about that. You think about everybody knows everybody. 
But even a statistic came out worldwide, the most recognized phase worldwide is the rock. Mm. And you know what the percentage is? 56%, 57%. You know, when you're in the YouTube world, you think everybody knows, but it's a very big world. No, born and raised in Iran, lived there 10 years. When Khomeini died, six weeks after he died, we escaped and went to Germany. I lived at a refugee camp in Germany for a couple of years. Came to the States when I was 12 years old, went to Glendale, California. I joined the army right afterwards, went to the 101st Airborne Division, Air Assault, got out, wanted to be a bodybuilder. I was kind of wanting to follow Arnold's footsteps. Uh, even went to the same community college he went to, Santa Monica Community College, and then I realized what it would take to be Mr. Olympia, the amount of things I need to put in my body. I'm 6'5", I had to be a 350, 400 pound frame during the off season. I said, no, uh, folks who buy, win Mr. Olympia nowadays are around 5'9", 5'10", 5'11". Met a girl, worked in the financial industry, Morgan Stanley Dean with her. She introduced me to Morgan. I started working there the day before 9-11. Got my series 766, 31, 26, Life and Health. After Morgan went to Transamerica, was there for about seven and a half years, did very well for myself. October of 09, started my own insurance company with 66 agents. We grew it today. We've licensed 43,000 agents. We're in 49 states. We have a few hundred offices nationwide. We just sold the company a year ago to an integrity marketing group, Silver Lake. It was a beautiful exit, multi, multi, nine figure exit. And then at the same time, accidentally, I started a YouTube channel. We grew it to what it is today. Uh, total by 10, and we have shy of 6 million subscribers and, you know, some views on it. How do you accidentally start a YouTube channel? It was literally accidental because I was creating content privately for my sales guys. And then one day Mario says, Pat, why don't we go public? And to me, I've always been the private guy where you, my friends never knew who I was dating until I made it public. So if I wanted to kind of make it public, I chose to make it public, but I, I didn't want people in my business. So the more and more times change, you realize we're all naked today. So you either pivot and adjust to it. And if you don't, somebody else is going to tell your story. So I said, okay, let's start creating content. We tested it for about two years, one video a week, every single week for two years, we put the video up. Podcast or training? It's just a two minute video. It's called Two Minutes with Pat. It's a motivational type of video. Wow. And then two years later, you know, we kind of buckled down and I said, let's get a little bit more focused. I went to an event in San Diego. The guy said, pick one word to create content around a guy named Michael Hyatt. And uh, he was a CEO of a former CEO of Thomas Nelson, I want to say. Very smart guy. So we said capitalism, entrepreneurship. And that became my word, entrepreneurship. And then we started creating content. And in that niche, later on, we went wide. Mm -hmm. so. And so you've been doing that for how long? How long did it take? The first get video we uploaded was December or November of 2012. And then um, I couldn't tell you when we got to a half a million subs. It was a slow two years. Two years later, we probably had a thousand or two thousand subscribers, very mm -hmm. slow. And then we got to the niche, then we went to a hundred thousand subs, and then quarter million, a half a million. And then at a half a million, I took a break. At like 460,000 subs, we took a break. And I said, I, I got to find out what I'm going to be doing. I took a three month break, nothing, not one video, no content, nothing, but pure. Uh, uh, break and then three months later I said we're gonna do this we gotta do this the right way I'm gonna build a media company so Valuetainment became the name I thought we came up with the name there was already a name called Valuetainment it was a, a publicly traded company in uh, Germany I reached out to the CEO Dirk I asked to sell the domain to us he said not not at the time and it was two years later he sold uh, changed his company's name to Value Tees. I bought the domain that became a company and then today we have a uh, consulting firm that's growing rapidly. We have a product development site at the, our headquarters. Manect is now a product which experts like yourself get to get paid based on a, if somebody texts you and DMs you on Instagram, yeah. you respond back, you're like, why would I respond back to I'm not making any money. And the other people are like, only 10% of the time people respond back. So we launch Manect. It allows you to pay for text, pay for video communication and FaceTime with somebody and you pay by the minute. And then uh, this year right here is a comedy club. We do live podcasts here. We have a cigar lounge in the back. We're about yeah, to look launch. Yeah. Did you see it? Yeah. yeah, cigar lounge in the back. And uh, yeah, we, I mean, we got this this whole thing accidentally turned into what it is today. Mm -hmm. when, when Steve Jobs and Wozniak started Apple, I interviewed Wozniak. One of the books we made as our book of the month prior to me interviewing Wozniak in 2011 was a book called Accidental Millionaire. You couldn't find this book. It was hard to find. It was a book where the author, I think left a bunch of former employees 
of Apple got together to bash Steve Jobs and Steve uh, Wozniak. This is why he got fired, because he's not a good leader. You know, this Apple's another company. Mm -hmm. And then later on, uh, the next book that came out was about Facebook, and that was called The Accidental Billionaire. So The Accidental Billionaire was about Apple. Accidental Billionaire is about uh, Zuck. I'm assuming there's going to be an accidental trillionaire here mm -hmm. soon next few years. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that's going to be about. Probably Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah, we have so a good idea. we're going. So you sold completely out of the, the Yeah, I'm 100%, I sold 100%. I'm still operating the company. And the uh, uh, majority of it was cash. A portion is left in the company that I'm helping right now grow. We got a record break in so April. you still got equity there. I do. Okay. Small percentage, but I've been, I'm one of the bigger shareholders of the bigger company. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, we had a record break in April. It's growing. Um, we're having a lot of fun there, but it's the next phase of the company. Yeah. And so the media company that's value tainted, what does it, when you say media company, that can mean a lot of different things. What exactly is the business? Good question. Yeah. So we we're building an OTT, which we'll be doing movies. We'll be doing shows. We'll be recruiting talent. We'll have our own Johnny Carson. We'll have our own TV shows. We'll have our own SNL model. We'll do all of that. Okay. Wow. However, the niche that we're going to have is the following niche. So if you think about Disney, you think the audience are kids for the most part, right? You think about Nickelodeon kids. So the, the niche for kids is two brands, Nickelodeon, Disney, predominantly dominated by Disney. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you think about sports, if you were to say, what is the brand media company that we think about sports, you would think about ESPN. ESPN. And second's going to be probably Fox Sports, let's just say. But it's not, you know, they're dominated in the marketplace with ESPN. If I were to tell you sci-fi, you know, all that stuff, you may go to Avengers, DC Comics, Star Wars, you're going to go that way. If I told you, you know, uh, authors who write and make movies about law, you know, what happens with lawyers and all this stuff, there's going to be an issue. For us, we want to buy movies, docs, everything related to business. So Pursuit of Happiness, we would buy that movie if it was coming out today. Uh, uh, founder, the story of uh, with Michael Keaton's story of Ray Kroc, we would buy mm -hmm. that today. And Ron Documentary, that's us. Anything having to do with business, capitalist, entrepreneurship, like you know the documentary they did, The Men Who Built America, that mm -hmm. uh, documentary that's a very big documentary for capitalism, we would bid for that documentary today mm -hmm. and we would put it on our OTT. So yeah, that's what we're going to be doing the next 20 to 40 years. I think there's a big threat right now where the hero making machine is confusing. I don't know if you have kids. Mm -hmm. uh, three-year-old. You have a three-year-old? Yeah. Okay, boy or boy or girl. girl. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when you and I were grow, grow, growing up, we knew who the hero was. Now, how old are you, by the way? What year were you? I'm born? 41. You're 41. Okay, I'm 44. So we're three years yeah. apart. Same age. Okay. So you're an 81 baby. Yeah. An 80, 81 baby. Okay. Who was your hero in high school? Who was our hero in high school? If yeah, you were to say who's a hero, who would you say? Like outside of my dad. Outside of parents. You know, I'm not mom, your dad. I'm talking like somebody that's a celebrity. Mm -hmm. I want to be like Mike. Yeah, Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan. Michael, Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. You know, those guys. You know, in business, maybe we looked at some of these life of the rich and famous who mm -hmm. made their money, business, real estate. At the time, yeah. it could probably be Trump. Even Tupac would talk about Trump. Free I politics. When I was Art of the deal. Right. So, you know, so to us, it's like, man. You know, I used to walk down from Verdugo, or Wilson Jr. High School, and I would ask my friends, I would say, hey, you have a choice between being Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player in the world, Michael Jackson, the greatest performer in the world. You have a choice between being a president or being the richest man in the world. Who do you want to be? And we would talk, oh, I want to be this, I want to be that, this dream that we have. Today, kids are confused. Mm. Today's heroes are not as clear as they once were. Right. So you and I didn't grow up being confused. They're being confused today. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think when you have an era like that, certain people have the audacity to rise up and want to fight against some of these bullying that's taking place. Mm -hmm. Our reasoning for wanting to build our media company is strictly that. I have four kids. I'm going to do my part. And I think there's a lot of other people that also want to do that. That's why we chose to, at this point of the game, my life, I can stop doing nothing and purely based on my investments that I make, I have an incredible life today. But this next move isn't because I need another $200 million or I need another car or I need another this. I'm not creating YouTube because I'm trying to be famous or I want people to stop by and say, can I take a selfie with you? I don't have a need for that. It's purely, I want my guys that are growing up, these kids to realize what the true hero is. And you fight to be a great hero that's respected by others and not get confused by the mess that 
media selling us today. Yeah, yeah, and that was my next question. Like, obviously, you don't have to do this. <laughs> you don't have to be here. You don't have to do anything. Why? Why continue? Um, you can live a nice life. I could too. Um, a lot of people ask me, is it ego? Is it this? Is it that? Is it the selfies? Is it the all that stuff? But but it's not for me either. It's to help people and to continue trying to better better the better the world. Um, for you know younger people, speaking of heroes and people that you know someone to look up to and stuff like that. What do you what do you tell kids that are confused right now? Um, you know, what's what's your message to kids who may be confused about, you know, who their hero is or, um, you know, kids that are coming out of high school who want to be business people, want to be millionaires and um, do the right thing and stuff like that. What do you tell, what do you, what's your thoughts on in today's world, you know, kids trying to get into the, the entrepreneurship When you say space. kids, what age are you talking about? I'm talking, right out, I'm talking right out of high school, right, right at that point where... They're ready to go. Yeah. Right. They're ready to go do something big. So first of all, my my first message would be to the parents: get involved because parents are not as involved as they need to be. If you're not, you're going to lose your kids, and it's going to hurt a lot. And when I mean hurt a lot, you could lose your kids for two decades. And what do you mean by losing my kids? Are they going to go to jail? Are they no? You you don't lose your kids physically because they go to jail or they're hanging out with gangsters or drugs. That's not what I'm talking about. When you lose your kids to an ideology. You, you don't have that relationship you once had with them. And if you lose them for 20 years, let's just say you lose them for two decades. You lose them from 16 years old to 36. If you lose them from 16 years old to 36, let's say you're 40. You're losing them from 40 years old to 60 years old. That is a very wide gap at the right era to not lose them because 40 to 60, you can still go do stuff with them. Your energy is still higher. To show back up at 60, well, let's just say at that time they have common sense and they're kind of going through somebody got a promotion over them, even though they were working hard, but that person got a promotion because of whatever criteria they had to reach with an ESG score and DEI score. So they would kind of try to meet a certain criteria. Like, wait a minute, I outworked that person. That person's always late. They always bitch. They always complain. In fact, they even talk smack behind the boss's back. I'm doing my part. I have the degree. I went in above and beyond and took that course. I go on Udemy. I'm learning how to get better. What's going on here? And then they... Reality sets in and they're like, okay, this this philosophy ain't working. I'm starting to realize I work this hard and I pay this much of it for taxes. Why? Streets are still messed up. Mm. The bridge is still messed up. City's not safe. San Francisco, they're showing right now, New York Times, an article came out where bosses are telling their employees in San Francisco, when you come to work, don't wear jewelry and your rings when you come to work. Can you imagine in America, the greatest country in the world, a supervisor and a boss has to tell their employees, don't wear your watch and rings and jewelry when you come to work. This is America. What do you mean don't wear your watch and your jewelry when you come to work? A $300 million building in San Francisco right now, commercial real estate, is standing alone. No one's in there. No one's renting. It's empty. This is a $300 million building on the main strip that you want to be on in San Fran. It's probably going to end up trading at $80 million if they're lucky because nobody wants to buy a building over there. Mm -hmm. Commercial real estate is taking a hit. So again, if I go to that direction with parents, I would first say, parents, do not lose your kids. Second to the kids. The one thing about kids, yesterday I'm having a conversation with my niece. This girl is at the grade she's in. She's the smartest out of all of us. And she's in eighth grade. Really proud of her. She was number one at the top of her class, eighth grade, at a very good school. She'll be number one in ninth grade as well. She's been invited to go to this private uh, 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 university, very well-known university. You know who it is. We all know who it is. And uh, for privacy reason, I won't disclose it, to go be a lawyer. And they're recruiting kids at all these universities. And she was recommended by the top of the school, so she's going to go to this place. And she's having this conversation. I'm a little concerned. This is too weak. And... You know, should I send them? Should I not? What do I do? What if my roommates are this? What if my roommates are that? So listen, you, you have the right values and principles in your head where you know how to process issues. And you know the difference between right and wrong. You, you and I knew the difference between right and wrong at a very early age that our parents didn't need to tell us. If you and I chose to do the wrong thing, it's because we chose to do the wrong thing and we knew, right? One of the best things my mom ever told me and my dad would tell me is, listen, 
You may lie to me, you may get away without telling me what you did wrong. God's always watching you. That phrase, whether you believe in God or not, parents, uh -huh. if you tell your kids God's watching when you screw up, your kids are going to be thinking about that if you tell them, oh, trust me, I thought about it, God knows how many times I'm like, shit, I'm about to do this, but he's watching, I'm not going to do it, my mom's not going to know, my dad's not going to know. Mm -hmm. So I think for kids, choose the better heroes, take your time with suddenly buying into someone's ideology, look at the life people have, and then from there make a decision of who you want to go. I was watching Jesus Revolution last night with the kids. Somebody recommended us watch this movie. One of my employees at the office, I'm like, what's this movie about? I didn't realize it was by Greg Laurie. And I don't know if you know Greg Laurie. He's out of LA. He's done big things, Calvary Chapel, all this other stuff. And we're watching it. Here's a kid. They're doing drugs. They're doing this. They're doing that. They're doing this. They're part of the hippie phase. And what about him? So my son says, Dad, why do, you, why do you think so many people don't like hippies? I said, who doesn't like hippies? I don't know. Every book I read, they say bad things about hippies. Mm -hmm. I said, who should think about your father? Okay? I paused the movie. I said, you're 45 years old. You have a 16-year-old daughter who starts hanging out with these hippies. Because hangs out with these hippies, your daughter starts doing drugs. And all of a sudden, she does a little bit too much drugs. She dies at 18 years old. If she didn't hang out with those hippies, your daughter would still be with you. How do you feel about hippies? Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't like them. I said, many people have these stories. Mm -hmm. Now, does this mean this happened every day and all the time? No. But that pain of losing your kid to a community yeah. that was making them feel like this is the right thing to do, this is happiness, this is freedom, it's liberating, let's do this. One bad decision away from ruining your life. Especially so, in today's world. Oh my, and you know, today probably more accessible and available than before. But at least when you and I- You're going to thing. Yeah. <laughs> but we see, when you and I party and we did dumb things, I don't know if you did, I definitely did oh, when I was younger. Thank God there was no Instagram and Snapchat oh, yeah. and TikTok because if those <laughs> videos ever came about, You'd be seeing me on the stage, you're like, what is this guy doing, right? They're not free of that today. Right. You do something dumb today, you yeah. want a job 20 years from now, yeah. that picture's gonna be on social media. So yeah. I, I would tell the kids to use some of your common sense, and if you're able to say no to your friends today while they're all doing dumb things, long term, they're all gonna look at you as the leader. Short term, they'll make fun of you. Short term, they'll criticize you. Long term, you'll have the meeting where they'll come up to you and they'll say, you know that one time we were trying to get you to snort coke and you said no and we all did it? You know that one time about ecstasy you didn't do? You know that we, we were all smoking weed and you weren't doing it yet? Behind closed doors, we talk a lot of shit about you. This is now we're all 31 years old. Behind closed doors, we all respect you because you were able to control, we could not. Yeah. yeah. But it takes 15 years for you to realize you were a leader. If you yeah. can do that, future looks bright for you. Right. You talked about on a, on a podcast, which I've seen you do on a couple of different other people's podcasts. Is that something you're doing now not necessarily i mean just like yourself when you reached out the team will filter it out and we'll kind of look at who it is and you know if we see the content that you know who you are kind of matches who we are and we can bring value and there's some kind of a opportunity there we'll entertain it but there are certain podcasts we're not going to say no to yeah know, like yeah joe calls and says you're going to be on a podcast you're not going to be like <laughs> let me think about it right but no you know my my time today I don't need to go on a podcast to get eyeballs. Yeah. Uh, we, we have a distribution channel that we're getting plenty of eyeballs, but I love a good interview and I love talking to people that have questions that I didn't think about before that makes me work. Mm -hmm. And if you can make me work and I leave your interview and I'm doing homework and research on my own, I'm like, mm -hmm. I never thought about it. What a great question. That's what I'm looking at with some of these other podcasters I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, whether it was a podcast interview, he said we're in for a 20 year war. Right? Yeah. I remember saying that? Absolutely. What, what, what did you mean by that? I, I, f philosophical war. You know, ideology war. This is going to be a war of ideas. And the, the, the dark side is going to be willing to, you know, go at it in ways you may not be willing to go to. They're willing to go places you may not want to go to, you know? They're willing to break the rules and the law and play dirty that... Uh, your values and principles may not want you to go there. But when you're playing this kind of a dirty war that we're going to be going through the next 10, 20, 30 years, there are certain things. A guy commented today on one of the posts, and I, I, I love what he said. He says, Pat, whatever happened to the five years of you saying you try to control yourself from not talking about politics? Mm -hmm. Okay, He's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And I said, what a great question. I said, well, if you impose, infringe, 
force your ideas, your philosophies on my kids and divide them against me, mm-hmm. you just you just woke up the wrong side. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. where I don't play. I'm a very friendly guy. I, I like a good joke. I like good conversations. I like a good game of domino spades. Let's sit down, talk, watch a good debate, a good movie, a good sporting event. But you cross that line, I'm not that friendly. Have and I'm going to stand up. No, not in the household. We are. I just feel like they're threatening. They're knocking on the door. But it is happening. They want to. When I say household, we're not divided. Right now, we're not divided. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I mean, as far as do you has any of this ideology of entered? Yes. Yeah. I know what you yeah. mean. Yes, absolutely. It has definitely entered. And the questions kids are asking today, my 11-year-old and my 9-year-old, are different questions than they were asking three years ago. And I'm not one that makes them feel uncomfortable. I talk about everything with my kids. And I mean everything at a young age. I think you have to nowadays. You know, parents who are like, I'm uncomfortable to talk to my kid about sex. Don't worry. If you don't talk about it, others will and they'll confuse your kids. Mm-hmm. Start talking about sex early. I'm com- uncomfortable to talk to them about drugs. What if this... Start talking about all of the drugs early on. I'm com- uncomfortable to talk about porn and talk about it with your kids early on. So, yeah, I'm, I'm taking a complete different strategy, but... I think, uh, uh, you know, this is a season where the man upstairs is looking for some leaders mm-hmm. to stand up. And, uh, you know, it's it's going to be a, um, like I said, the war part. It's going to be a very interesting next 20 years. You, you know, you know what wrong people you don't want to fight? It's the guys that have no desire to fight. There are guys that are just itching for a fight. When you go to a bar, you know, there's a group that's just like drunk. And mm-hmm. so, oh, what'd you say? You know, yeah. I'm not trying to fight you. I just want to come here and talk to you. You good? Mm-hmm. Right, but, hey, good to talk to you. You know, what do you like? You like the Lakers? You like this? Oh, very cool. Awesome bar. Right? And then there's a guy that's just coming and minding his own business. He just wants good food. He just kind of wants to be left alone, enjoy his company. And you push him once. He's, he's cool. Second time, third time, fourth time. And then eventually he's like, look at that. He just wants to lie. I'm telling you, don't do this. Then this is a lifelong mission. You, you wake up those types of people. They typically don't wake up just for a season or two. Mm-hmm. They're going to be around They're for keep them. They're not going to stop. They're relentless. Yeah, so. I know the type. Yep. I've got a ton more questions, but I know we're kind of limited on time. I want to dive into the real estate market with you, uh, kind of your thoughts and uh, so on and so forth. But what I see, I'll tell you what I see when I get your, your take on it. But I kind of feel like there's this, I'm going to call it a perfect storm happening in the group right now. Because I read an article where Zonda did a survey uh, that 98% of millennials want to be homeowners. The number one reason was to build their own equity instead of someone else's, and among several other reasons. So it it made me start to think, sort of curious. So I Googled, and I said, what's the median age of a first-time homebuyer? And in 2021, it was 33, right? Last year, it was 36. So I thought, okay, we've got 33 and 36-year-olds, that's millennials. That's the median age of a first-time home buyer. We have 72 million in America, and 98% want to be a homeowner. And so I said, okay, um, 33 to 36. So what's going on 33 years ago? So I went to 50-year birth rates, and you see a really, I, ha- I have a, a chart, but you see a really big spike in 1990 of uh, births. Um, so, you know, there was the baby boomers, which was a crazy spike. And it came down, and it stayed down through the 80s. And in 90, boom, and it stays like that. And so we have this year more 33-year-olds, people turning 33 in the U.S., than we've had probably in our life, let's just say, in a long, long time. And the 33-year-olds will be 35 next year, 36 the next year, the next batch of 33-year-olds are coming. These people want to own houses, okay? So right now as we speak, and here, here's something that people don't realize um, because of all the negative media and everything. Because you hear about prices down, right, especially year over year. But what no one talks about is the fact that and there are a few people that are talking about it, but prices bottomed out about 30 to 60 days ago. And here in Fort Lauderdale, prices never went negative year over year, um, not even close. But as far as the country goes, we're up and we're positive on the year price-wise right the second. Um, Nobody's really talking about that. I'm trying to to spread that message a little bit and talk about how the market is. So you've got a record amount of 33-year-olds entering the market. 
you've got no inventory. We have less inventory. You know, in the 1980s, it, there were always two to three million houses for sale. Okay. Right now we have under a million. And when you take out the pending deals, we're at 500,000. 500,000 active listings, comparing that to the 80s, where it was two to three million the whole decade. Um, we have less inventory than we had in 2021. No new listings are coming up because nobody wants to sell their house because they're sitting on 50% interest rates. Builders slow down. Um, so we have this, the, in my mind, we have historic pins up demand to buy houses um, with no inventory. And every, and a lot of them, you know, we're seeing multiple offers though. Uh, NAR came out and said that we went from 2.7 offers per listing to 3.2 in the last 30 days. Um, and, and a lot of, so we're, we're having activity, but it's because of the supply and demand issue. But as we move forward, buyers are sitting on the fence because of interest rates, right? They're sitting around 6.3, something like that. As inflation continues to go down, which way would you say inflation is going? Up or down? Uh, I think at this point it's probably going to level out, if not go even a bit lower. Yeah. yeah. So 30-year fix follows inflation, right? It follows inflation. So we have a pretty good idea that that in, that inch mortgage rates are going to continue to ease down. We've got more demand than we've ever seen. And we have no inventory. I'm calling this the perfect storm because I, I believe that when mortgage rates do tick down to whatever that magic number is going to be, whether it's 5.9 or 5.7 or whatever it is, it makes everybody say, okay, now's the time. Um, it's just going to be a flood and we're not going to have any houses to sell. It's going to make prices shoot up. I think we're going to see double digit price year over year price increases. We're already positive on the year. So at when mortgage rates started coming up, the Fed started raising rates, you came up with the video, going to crash worse in 2008, all that stuff. What do you think now after it's been a year? My position hasn't changed. The biggest, the biggest thing that I said, if you watch that video is, if they get involved like they did and start doing quantitative easing, these banks are going to sit there and say, we don't have to worry about it. You're protecting us again. You notice what uh, uh, Jamie Dimon just did with Chase coming into uh, First Republic, buying them out, you know, buying and then having the U.S. government get involved to buy the, you know, junk paper that they have. And I mean, you realize how much manipulation that is where I know I'm doing business and it's mathematically impossible for me to fail at a time like this when the government's willing to bail me out. It doesn't mean we're making the right choices. It just means they keep delaying the problem. You and I may not pay for it today. It may be five years, 10 years, 20 years down the line, but you cannot keep going into debt the way we keep going yeah. into debt. So I know as a, a, a realtor and a loan officer, you seem very confident where you're at right now. Uh, what you haven't yet experienced is unemployment that's coming next. Mm -hmm. When unemployment comes and people can't make their mortgage payments, mm -hmm. you know what happens after that. Commercial real estate today, it's predicted that one and a half trillion dollars will default, mm -hmm. prices will drop 40% mm -hmm. in, unemploy in uh, 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 commercial real estate, specifically uh, A, uh, Class A buildings, Class B buildings, the industrial buildings, they're gonna be fine. Matter of fact, their prices have gone up because people are buying less of the traditional business you know, units that we were buying before. Today, they want more industrial. The Amazons, the warehouse model, that's gonna be doing fine and the directions we're going they're not gonna be effective. A commercial is gonna take a hit. The more we experience these layoffs, you're then gonna experience that. Because now as a buyer, I'm gonna sit down and say, babe, we have an income for, we have had no income for three months. Cash is depleting, what do we do now? Do we keep the 4%? Do we sit there and say, hey, you know, we, we're gonna be fine. Or do you go into foreclosure? Do you not make the payment? Do we sell it? If we do sell it, then you're flooded with options and opportunities. Then what happens to the marketplace? So. As, as much as, you know, in certain ma markets, you're not going to experience that. Like the one I'm in, you're not going to experience that here. Miami is already experiencing a bit, okay? Because you know how Ma Miami's market prices went up tremendously mm -hmm. the last two or three years. Sales is down. Um, it's very easy as a realtor and a loan officer to only use the data that favors you to say, you know, 2.7 to, you know, yeah. Three point this many offers as a real, I'm, I'm a guy that was a stockbroker, a series seven guy. I know how to sell something to a client only talking about the data. 
that I can present for the person. We're salespeople, I get that. But at the same time, you have to kind of sit there and talk about the realities of it that yes, if you choose to buy today, if I'm making offers today, you're saying offers are up. Of course offers will be up, why? I have inventory. And not only the inventory, there's no inventory. I've been making a bunch of aggressive offers. Mm-hmm. I'm making more offers today than ever in my life. Why? I'm saying, hey, how much you want for this thing? Three million real estate. I'll pay you 1.9 million. You're, you're buying real estate? Commercial, not residential. Yeah. I'm more yeah. into commercial uh, right now. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities. Just right here, if I told you how many foreclosures, you know, the, the, the commercial property, uh, uh, just a block away from here is 52,000 square feet. It traded in 2008 for $13.5 million, okay? In 2008, 15 years ago, for $13.5 million. You can buy that right now for $8 million. bucks. It's a block away from here, okay? There's a hockey spot up here that we're asking for $18 million bucks three years ago, 15 to $18 million. Bucks. You can probably pick up that spot right now for $6 to $7 million. There's a building down on Cypress Creek that's a 300,000 square feet at $89 million bucks three years ago. It's about to close right now for $46 million, from $89 million. So these types of things are out there. The residential one, I think people haven't run out of savings yet. Mm-hmm. When you run out of savings and that savings starts depleting lower and lower and lower and lower and lower, when people panic, and then there's gonna be the fire cell. And when the fire cell comes, you know, you'll sit there and say, oh my God, why is that guy selling that for them? Why is this guy selling this for this much? Now, by the way, I hope it doesn't happen. When I say, like, I don't benefit from residential properties taking a hit. It's not like I'm planning for residential to take a hit because I'm going to go buy a 600 unit this or I'm going to go buy. I'm not in that space. You will not see me being in the residential game. Okay? It's not my game. So if it does take a hit or if it doesn't take a hit, I don't have the selfish, like, for example, in baseball cards. I think baseball cards are going to take a hit. So am I going to participate in that? Of course I am. If baseball cards take a massive hit the next year or two years, I'm going to probably deploy 230 million bucks into the baseball card. Mm-hmm. So I know that residential, if it does or if it doesn't, it does literally nothing to me to my network or my income. Yeah. I just feel the audience needs to be prepared for it. Yeah. I feel like uh, I agree with you on commercial. It's definitely going to take a hit. Um, on the residential for foreclosures, they, there was a study done. There's, Americans on Americans on average have fifty eight percent equity in their home on average. So if they become delinquent, they'll just sell it and make whatever. I don't see a wave of foreclosures happening. Um, and with the with a massive amount of was 30, that studied on by fifty eight percent. I think it was uh and how M- MBS. It was real very recent. Fifty eight percent is it forty two percent loans of value on average. It's because prices went up so much. That's the driving right. factor. Well, you, you're, you're, uh, uh, we have to assume that it's going to stay like that, okay? We have to assume that it's going to stay like that uh, with it staying up. And, you know, when we give a blanket statement like that with numbers, I will fully respect that if it's a demo, if it's a certain area, if it's a certain zip, if it's a certain city. You know, Greenwich, the first time in 20 years that the... the uh, uh, what do you call it, a uh, uh, real estate value trial. They have not experienced that for a minute. Now, why is that? So, you know, if you're living in a place where the policies favor, you know, like right now, I'll give you an idea, Dwayne Wade just moved out of the state of Florida, okay? And he's being interviewed, why'd you move out of the Florida? So I can't be there because it doesn't match my values and principles with my son, my daughter, whatever, you know, the, the transition that his kid went through and they're going through that battle with him and his ex-wife. Okay, I understand why he left Florida. Why? Well, 351,000 people left. Uh, it was a plus minus, first time ever California had a net to growth to their uh, population since 1851 when California barely got started. Why? Mm-hmm. People are not moving to California. Yeah. People are moving to California, but a lot more people are moving out than moving in. Mm-hmm. So if I'm gonna sit there and bank on buying something in certain areas in California, I have to be a little bit careful. So again, my statement is we can't make a blanket statement across the board, right? Yeah. Like right now, be careful, the stock market's gonna crash. Yeah, but you got certain things you can buy right now that you're still gonna be fine with today, right? Um, hey, you know, buy blue chip stocks in the NBA. Zion Williamson looked like he put on a lot of weight. You can buy as many Zion Williamson cards right now. He's played fewer games than Greg Oden did, and we heard what happened with that guy. He was out of the NBA. 
Mm-hmm. And he's not showing discipline to want to come back and want to compete and yeah. get in better shape. So, hey, you have to know. Now, he may be different than John Morant, than this player, than that player. All I'm saying is one statement and a stat that we can cherry pick doesn't apply across the board to everything. Yeah. Locally here, we're seeing so many homes that were on sale. Lower 100,000, lower 200,000. There was a flyer that came to our Price house yesterday. Here. I understand that, but there's a, there's a difference between prices being up. Yesterday, a flyer came in a house on the corner of the water, okay? Five bedroom, four bath. They were asking 5.9 million a year ago. They're now asking 3.9 million. It's on the intercoastal from 5.9 to 3.9. Why did they lower by 2 million? What are they, because they were asking too much. What did they buy it for? What, what, they buy what, it? The, what you just, you just answered your own question though. Most people think, most people are asking too much today. Yeah. Of yeah, course, well, most people are asking value too much. And closed prices are higher. Comps, asking price, sure. closed price. But I mean, even if you go with comp and you, you, you use the comps from a uh, year ago, use the comps from two years ago, uh, you know, versus use the comps today. Uh, you know, like even from the moment rates started climbing, Silicon Valley went through what it went through. The guys that came in here that have a half a billion dollars worth of real estate themselves, and they're saying, hey, can we go 40, 60 on this deal with you? You know, I get a call from my realtor and say, so what happened? Did they finish up that deal? No, they can't get the cash. Why can't they get the cash? They just don't have the cash. So I thought these guys were crushing it. Well, they are, but they don't have the cash to close. So today, as you're going through a lot of these deals, our savings, what we had collectively as a nation a year ago, in Q1 of 2022, we had around $2.1 trillion of cash. Yeah. Every quarter, that thing went down $300 billion. So we went from $2.1 trillion to $1.8 trillion to one5 That's collective savings in America, right? $1.5 yeah. trillion. That's still not down yet. Mm-hmm. If that thing keeps depleting lower and lower, people then start making panic sales. Yeah. We're not there yet. Yeah. You know, we are not there yet. The expectation for unemployment numbers to take a hit is more on Q3, not Q2. We may see some of it the last, the next two months, but uh, God willing, none of that stuff happens. Because if unemployment goes high, what happens to crime? That goes high. Yeah. Who's affected by it? I got four kids, man. I do not want to see unemployment go high. Yeah. I want my wife to drop off the kids and us not have to worry about anything. When you see some of the crime that's happening right now, what, what causes that? Financial, unemployment, yeah. got to pay the bills, you're scared, you're worried, what do you do? So nobody is sitting here screaming, we want the end of the world. If I'm single and if I have no kids, if I'm not married and I make money on selling fear, go at it. You can accuse me of that. I, in an ideal world, I want nothing to happen to unemployment. I will say this to you, though, and I, I don't know whether you'll agree with this or not. Um, I don't know if 100% financing is a good idea. I don't know if 80% financing is a good idea. I don't know if raising now loans from 30 years to 40 years is a good idea, which they just approved a month ago. You saw this, this is your world. So I don't know if it's good for us to go from 40 to 50, Mm -hmm. because all we're doing is we're making another argument to sell a house to somebody that really shouldn't buy the house. And so what happens when we sell homes to people that shouldn't be buying the house? They're not ready to buy that house. They haven't shown a sign of responsibility to do it. Mm-hmm. So for me, I think it is better to keep the rates at around 6%. Mm-hmm. We've had it for 6% for 40 years. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you, you, you've seen the history. For, you know, when people are saying, right, well, you know, I can't believe there is no 2.8%. If buyers want to get 2.8%, that 128-month economic expansion, that may have been one of the worst things we did to America, to go 12 years or 11 years. Obviously, it was 10 years, and then COVID happened, and then it continued. One of the worst things we did because we spoiled Americans. We need to go back to the 6%. I would like to see us go back more to, you need a 20% down payment. But you know, if we go to that route, prices are going to drop because not a lot of people can do that. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it's more complicated than just a simple supply and demand, right? Because there's no inventory, right? And there's a lot of demand. Do you, where, my, I guess the biggest question for the residential side, residential. I have an argument for you. In 2008, there was 4 million properties for sale. Um, where where does the inventory come from that creates the oversupply that? I got a question for you though. Yeah. Okay, so there is no inventory. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna bully me and force me to pay 30% higher? Okay, then the question becomes, 
Where does the income increase come from? Mm-hmm. My income hasn't increased for 20 years. Yeah. Go look at the median income. By you know, 50, well, yeah, we've gone from 55 to 63 to 60, whatever the numbers they'll show up. Some markets were at 69. That's still not a big enough of a difference for me to be able to match up to buy a house where a guy's asking me to pay $1.2 million for a house that should be 750. Yeah. How do you expect me to pay for that? So you can increase it as much as you want, but I'm not making that kind of money for me to afford it. So the 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 argument for inventory is a argument I hear from a lot of realtors mm-hmm. and a lot of LOs. Mm-hmm. I totally get it. I understand. But your argument would be stronger if you can show me that this is up 40 points, but at the same time, income is also up 40 points. Mm-hmm. Income is also up where you can say, okay, right. you're making more money now. Guess what? You can afford to buy. It. Makes sense. But we don't have that argument. This can't go up and this stays flat mm-hmm. and you want me to go buy a house. Yeah. You put me in a bad situation. I agree there's an affordability issue. That's why there's a lot of buyers on the sideline. There's a lot of buyers sitting there that want to buy a house that can't. So um, I totally get that. Now, just to piggyback off that, um, somebody wants me to pay 30000 more, right? If, if, if they have somebody sitting there that has money to pay 30000 more, then that's that's okay. Sell it to them. I'm not going to pay you that's 30, a different story, though. Well, that's what's happening though. If, if the price is, it's worth what somebody's willing to pay. Yeah. So if so, if prices are say seven fifty, yeah. on the house we're trying to sell for one point two, and that's all he can get. That's all a buyer shows up and no problem. is willing to. Pay, I say to the guy that's that the can't. Value. I say to the guy that can't afford to buy it, don't buy it. Don't buy it. It's not a responsible decision you're making. I say don't buy it. I did a story in 2016, Denver Post. They came, they interviewed me, they're in my house, and they're at this house. I'm like, hey, so you buy this house? No, I'm renting this house. Why? Many different reasons. Tell us your reasons. I give all my reasons of why I'm renting. Uh, I'm nimble. I can move. You can't predict what direction real estate is going right now. The American dream isn't home ownership. The American dream to me is entrepreneurship and equity. Uh, go build a business. Increase your income. If you increase your income, later on you can go buy that house that you want, if not more. And my wife and I sat down in 2009 when we had just gotten married three months later and I told her, I said, listen, if you're expecting me to buy a big house, I'm not doing it. 100% of my life savings is going into a company I'm starting. And we're going to see what's going to happen later on. I'm going to buy it. We started up with an apartment complex at the Summit in Woodland Hills. We were tight. I was driving in Acadia. And everything went into the business to build equity. And then eventually that crew, we moved into a nicer apart, nicer house. And then Sino did a nicer house in a... a Trammell State Lane, and then we bought the house in a corner uh, where Barry Bond's agent was living right next to me, and there was a cul-de-sac house, beautiful home in the community. We bought 21 homes in this gated community. Then we bought another house in Dallas when we moved to Plano, and then we moved into another house, and then we bought this house that we have here. But the point is, do not fall for the temptation of buying a house today. I don't know if you're going to cut this or not, we're going to leave this. <laughs> do not buy a house and fall for the temptation of being forced to buy something you cannot afford. It is a mistake. Don't buy something you cannot afford today. Trust me. I'm telling you this from peace of mind. If you're forced to buy something you can't afford and all of a sudden something happens to your job and you only have six months of reserves or 12 months of reserves, there comes the argument, there comes the divorce, there comes three kids being raised because mommy and daddy couldn't handle finances together. There's already 50 different reasons to get a divorce. Marriage is already hard enough. If you get a divorce for real reasons, you can't get along, all this other stuff, I get it. But don't put yourself in a financial situation where you're getting a divorce to two money. Yeah. Okay. That's that's my... So your argument is a fine argument. My argument is pump the brakes. And I I totally agree. And I don't have a dog in the fire. I was was in the business in 2008 and it was easy to sell properties at 50% less. I don't care if prices go up, down, sideways, it doesn't matter. Well, professionals are going to do fine. I mean, you... The, the guys in your world that are professionals, you're not going to feel it. Bottom 60% is going to get filtered out. Okay? The other is going to come in. The guys that are the newer ones, the rookie ones. The performance and the cream of the crop is going to go to the top. And then the cycle goes. The insurance is very hard. Real estate is very hard. Mortgage is very hard. Yeah. The guys at the top are going to be. Yeah. yeah. They're not going away. We're going to do this again sometime. I look forward to it. I look forward Thank to it. Thank you. It's great. Appreciate, it, Appreciate you. I 
35 with a 